Rory Phillips is a singer-songwriter from the Snowy Valleys region of New South Wales. He released the single The Truth a couple of years ago and now has a new single Because Boys and he does quite a few other musical things as well, which we'll talk about. Hi, Rory. Hi, how are you going? I'm very well, thank you. And I'm going to get right into the new single. I'll start with the new single. You wrote Because Boys with Ashley Dallas and Freddie Bailey. Guitar, gold guitar winning Ashley Dallas. When did that, that songwriting happen? Uh, that songwriting all happened at the Academy. Um, if any of the listeners and viewers have heard of the Academy of Country Music up in Tamworth. Um, and yeah, I was up there interning with Freddie. We were both interns. And in between us running around like headless chooks and doing all the odd jobs and things, um, we had, you know, a couple of hours. And um, Lynn Botel said to us, well, why don't you sit down and write a song? Um, and we did. We went in with Ash and we wrote this song and it's what's become my new single. So Lynn, being the director of the Academy of Country Music, obviously is keeping an eye on everything right to, to the point of... of telling you when to write songs yes she knows what's happening when where always <laughs> so um and I, because you mentioned that you were have been an intern at the academy you've also been a student at the academy but I'm wondering what an internship is like compared with because you've also been a mentor recently but we'll we'll start with the internship um no no I haven't been a mentor I've only been an intern I'm a long oh, way sorry. Okay. Being a mentor. Um, <laughs> mentors are you know uh, this year at the senior course, we had Kevin Bennett and Melody Mocha, okay. Mickey Pye. Um, so they're all pretty talented individuals with a bag full of golden guitars between them. Um, but no, being being an intern is a really interesting thing. And I was sort of um, only really given the opportunity or get thrown in the deep end, I guess, um, 2021 was my which was the year that I wrote that song that I mentioned right. earlier. Um, but, you know, um, I think the, the way it works the most, the best is um, there's three interns and three group tutors and you put one intern with one tutor and um, basically it's just the intern's role to be helping out where they can and writing charts for the band to send off so that the interns don't have, uh, right. sorry, so, so the, um, the group leaders don't have to do that and basically just mm -hmm. frees them up to be focusing on the singer-songwriters and getting the best out of them. Mm -hmm. So you'd have been a student twice, I believe, before that. Yes. And obviously it's been a huge part of your musical life, the Academy. So when the first time you went, did you have any expectations about what would happen? Um, I've, to be honest, I can't really remember because I was nine, but um, I, was, I was a bit of a baby of the group. But um, yeah, I don't know, but if I had any expectations, I'm sure the Academy absolutely exceeded them. I think these days people tend to use the phrase that changed my life very lightly. Um, mm -hmm. but quite honestly, and I mean this with the most weight I can possibly um, put onto this statement, that it really did. It's where I met Lynn Botel, who's now my current singing teacher. It's where I met Roger Corbett who is in the Bushwhackers and he's probably my biggest mentor and he's given me a spot in his band and I've recorded all my songs with him and like, you know, and I made friendships that I made for life and I met a lot of industry professionals there who came in to tutor the students. It really did change my life. Right. And at the age of nine, I mean, that's, yeah, you know, a big decision for a, a yeah. At that age, you probably want to be running around and doing fun things and whatever. It, essentially, it is an apprenticeship going to the academy. It's work, but by that age, you'd obviously decided you were serious about music. Well, you know, you said and by that age you want to be running around doing fun things. That was running around doing fun things for me, right? In a okay. in a very intense format, mind you, um, and I don't think I realised quite how intense. Um, it was before I first went. So the, there you go. There's a little bit of an expectation I had. I didn't think it would be nearly as much hard work as it was because it really is mm -hmm. like 12 hour days. Um, right. Even for the juniors, you know, they, they show no mercy. And I mean that in the best <laughs> way possible. Um, but yeah, I don't know. 
I guess that was that was really what I wanted to do. And I'd been wanting to do that for years prior to coming to the academy. But I feel like that really, I don't know, it gave me a foot in the door um, to to move on to bigger and better things. Yeah. Well, I'll come back to Because Boys now because we could spend longer on the academy and I do want to find out more about your musical development. But speaking about the song, um, it does have a strong message, but I'm wondering what the key message is that you'd like listeners to take away from it. Um, well, I guess the, the whole song in itself is about um, mental health and, you know, boys and men, in case you hadn't guessed from the title, and um, how, they, how they don't talk about their feelings and they probably should. So that's the key sentiment of the song. But I think the message that I would want people to take away the most is that it, if this song of mine can affect one person's life, even just one, for the better, then it's achieved its goal. And I think that's the message that I really want to drive home because it's an important thing that needs to be talked about. And I want to use my, my little platform. It's not a particularly big platform, but it is a platform um, to try and push my little message and my piece of positivity. Yeah. Well, and it does have a lot of power from a teenage boy. I think it's one thing for adults to record a song saying, oh, you know, kids talk about your feelings, but you're living this at the moment. You'd be seeing it amongst your friends, um, amongst your peer group at the Academy, for example, I'm sure. So uh, have you had a good response to this song? Have people recognised the power that there is in you saying it in particular? I think so. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's done quite well for itself already. And um, people are, People are happy with the way it sounds and its message. And, you know, um, I experienced a little bit of it the last time I released a song, um, The Truth, because that was all about environmental action and climate change. And, well, it was a pretty broad, you know, like it wasn't super specific or anything, but that really was pretty clear that that was what the message was about. It was about political change. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I experienced a little bit of that um, with people responding to that and saying, you know, yeah, this is a great message. Go and listen to this song. And the same sort of thing's happening with this one. Um, and I'd like to think, I don't write a lot. I really don't. But I'd like to think when I do that it's sort of, because I do a lot of co-writes. I don't often write on my own. Um, so I kind of feel like all this energy just piles up inside me and I don't quite know how to get it out. And then eventually I'll sit down to write with somebody and something really powerful will come out with a big message in it um i'd like to think i write songs mm -hmm. and messages. so yeah well you've done my work for me rory because my next question was about <laughs> truth and it and the question was clearly you are not afraid to address big topics in your songs has this been an intention of yours from the start to use songs as a platform for discussion absolutely yes it has because yeah. <laughs> yeah. I said you did my work for me um, yeah. now you mentioned that you don't do a lot of writing on your own but can you remember when you wrote your very first song on your own um I don't know really I I did a little bit of writing when I was um I was a lot littler like I don't know six or seven maybe but that's that's sort of the stuff that would never ever have seen the light of day like I don't know that I ever played it at gigs um and I certainly never will um <laughs> but I don't know I've I've been writing music for a long time I often come up with little musical ideas and I've been doing that for as long as I can remember obviously the musical ideas got a lot better um I've written a few instrumentals things like that but I find words to be a bit of a struggle and it's not that I don't have anything to say it's just that I don't always quite know how to say it and that mm -hmm. is where places like, like the academy and I'm coming back to this again um really help it helped bring that out of me a little getting to write with industry pros um, hmm. So I've written a couple of songs with Roger now. I've written a song with Alan Caswell. I've written two songs with Alan Caswell, actually. Um, and, you know, this new song with Ash and Freddie. And um, I think the industry pros, they have this way of knowing what I want to say and knowing that I've got a really important message, but not only knowing what I want to say, but how I want to say it and how to get it out into the world. Yeah. But coming up with the music is also like an incredible skill. I think if if I were 
to try to write us words would actually be a lot easier musically I would just have no idea what to do so it's that great balance that can happen with co-writers and as you indicated you've written more than one song with some co-writers so clearly there are people who you just gel with mm. I, I do find that I gel quite well with Rog having written a few songs with him um, and another guy that I mentioned earlier Alan Caswell that man just makes songs fall from the sky and they just come out like finely crafted masterpieces you know there's some songs that you've got to sit there and kind of polish the rough edges for a little bit and work out the work out the cracks and um, fill in a few lines here and there but every time I've written with him they just sort of like there's your song it's done it's, it's right there already for you ready to go record it release it do something with it you know um yeah, right. so it is it is quite a cool thing and when you find a co-writer that you really gel with it's I think it's a special thing yeah now your cars and guitars EP was released in 2017 I'm guessing you would have been around 10 or 11 then well, we're um, going way back now yeah I yeah was 10. Yeah, you were 10, but your singing voice was already really distinct and formed. And I can hear that voice in the voice you have now, although obviously a boy's voice changes over those years. So I'm wondering when you started singing. Well, you used the word, what did you say? Distinctive and formed? Distinct and well and formed. And, and, and formed. Was, I'd, I'd say an identity. <laughs> if you if you were to ask me, um, I can't stand to listen to that anymore. Like oh, I'm proud really? of what I did as a as a ten year old, but I just listen to it now, and I feel like as musicians we all have this inner sense of perfectionism. It's like I can always do better. I can always do better. And just when you've done something that you're happy with, you go, yeah, but I could do it a little bit better. And right. I think that is really what's happened with that. And I'm super proud of it as a work. And I think, you know, I made that when I was 10. Like, that's really cool. It's, um, it's real cool. And right? I played all yeah. the guitars on it myself and sung all the vocals myself. And, you know, like, really, there was nobody else other than Roger. And there was one other person who played drums, Dave Roberts from Simply Bushed, on one song. Um, and... <laughs> You know, it, it was just us and I managed to create yeah. that and I think that's really cool. But, um, yeah, I can't stand it anymore. And I think that's a good thing because it means I've, I feel like I've improved a lot and um, sometimes I guess you lose sight a little of where you've come. But, yeah, I've been singing for um, since I was seven. I started learning off a, a local lady from Tumut who played in a couple of bands and um, I'm still really good friends with her. She's a lovely, lovely, lovely woman. Um, she actually, I don't know if you can see there on this side, she made the feathers yeah. on my hat there. She's a florist by trade um, and right. she did that. She did an amazing job. And then after a few years, after I'd been to the academy and I met Lynnie Botel, and if anybody's ever mm -hmm. heard Lynn Botel sing, she could sing the phone book. She's got an incredible voice. And yeah. um she said, she sort of sat me down and said, you know, I can see that you've gotten started and there's a really good voice in there. Let's try and work that out a little bit more. Do you want to do some singing lessons with me? And so I did. Um, and I've been working with her ever since. And she is really just, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm being stuck up, but she's made me sing like a bird. I think um, <laughs> her talents are incredible. And that's, that's, yeah none of me and all of her that's you know made <laughs> be able to do that um I think she's got a very special talent in being able to bring out the best in people yeah she's an extraordinary individual um and singer and you you're singing like a bird but I can hear that also in 10 year old you even though you think 10 year old you sounded like crap so we'll just we'll agree to disagree on 10 year old you and your <laughs> recording but um, but I'm wondering if the guitar playing came around the same time as you started singing or had you been already playing instruments before you began to sing no I had already been playing guitar and um I remember for that first sort of I mean I got my first guitar when I was five but I didn't start taking any lessons till I was six because um Mum had a friend who used to run a music store and he said to her when mum mum called her up, uh, mum called him up one day and said, you know, I'm, I'm looking at getting Rory a guitar. What should we do? And he said, well, the amount of people that come in after 12 months 
after buying their kid a guitar and saying, my, my child's not interested anymore, can you sell this for me? And they get, you know, a pittance of what they what they bought the guitar for 12 months ago. Um, so he said, just get him a guitar for 12 months. If he's still bashing it around the house and making some kind of noise, then get some lessons. And lo and behold, I still was. So they did. Right. Um, so I've been taking lessons since I was six. Um, but I remember during that first year between me learning to play and learning to sing that um, I would go out and busk a lot at the local cafe and I'd sit there and I'd play my songs instrumentally. Like I'd play normal songs. They weren't instrumental songs, but I'd play them without any words. And people would sit there and go, what's, what songs are you playing? Like, what's this one? And mum just sat me down one day and said, look, Rose, I know you love playing guitar, but if you want to get out and play in public, you're going to need to learn to sing as well. And I tell you, it was a real hurdle of mine to learn to play and sing at the same time. It, it is like patting your head and rubbing your tummy. Now, mm -hmm. nowadays I can sort of just do it automatically. I don't think about it. But for that first 12 months or so, it was a real battle getting there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the trickiest things I've ever learned to do, I think. Yeah, it is pretty, it is tricky to do because as you said, it's like patting your head and rubbing your tummy at the same time. When you learned to play guitar, did you learn to read music as well or you were play by ear? Well, I did and I didn't. For the first probably maybe not even 12 months, a little bit less than 12 months, I had a teacher who was primarily in brass and woodwind and classical instruments and stuff. So he really had this idea that, we should all learn sheet music for guitar. And a lot of people that I've spoken to about my experiences then say, yeah, you know, sheet music's good, but why did that guy try and get you to learn sheet music when you were six? You yeah. know, like he was just going to bore you to death. Why did he do that? Um, so as you can probably see, the point I'm getting to, I didn't stick with that very long. Um, and I, I turned to the guitar teachers of YouTube Right. Uh, and so yeah I'm mostly self-taught and as a, as a result of that I've found that I've got a very good well-developed um, but the rest of it just kind of falls on its face just a little bit um, I can't read sheet music I I mean I could sit there and read a tab if I did it slowly like I know how to do it I just strike like I can't sight read at all um, the one thing I do read theory wise is nashville numbers um nashville number charts are a great system for any musicians looking to get into it um it basically just turns the scale into a set of numbers and it means the same numbers can be applied to the same chords over any key it's amazing to any musos out there watching or listening i please go and check it out it'll change your life it's great um but i learned that at the academy once again and it is you know it's what all the all the country guys use to communicate you know you stick a piece of paper down there and there's your number chart and they go right everybody one two three four play the song see you at the end and that's how it goes it's great um so that is the one thing i know how to do in terms of reading any music i mean it is a language of music but it's not like mm -hmm. classical on a stave music yeah. Well, I have never heard of the National Number Card, so I'm going to look that up. But you are now uh, someone who learnt guitar from YouTube and that guitar is a Les Paul because you bought yourself a Les Paul the other day. I saw that on your Instagram. I did. I'm going to see if I can. It's up there. Hang on the wall. Oh, well, and it, and it looks lovely. And you mentioned that it was hard work that got you that guitar. Um, and I should also, also mention at this point that you gig a lot, actually. Um you're a member of the Bushwhackers, as you mentioned earlier, and you have your own gigs. So clearly gigging is something you love and continue to love. Yeah. Um, gigging has always been where it's at for me. You know, there's some people that say, oh, I could I could never go out and gig and I'm, I'm too nervous. I just like playing in my bedroom. And, you know, that whilst I understand it, that was never, ever the thing that, excited me about playing guitar like I just I don't want to I, well, I wouldn't say I wanted to be famous or anything like that and I still don't know that I really want to be famous like I'd like for people to know who I am but I don't know I don't know that walking down the street and being stopped every 10 seconds and being like oh my 
are you Rory Phillips? You know, like that's not something I really aspire to because to be quite honest, it sounds a bit annoying. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. I guess, I guess the thing that really attracted me to it the most is seeing musicians interact on stage, mm-hmm. um, you know, and that is a thing that can only happen in a live environment. And I think maybe that's why I love gigging so much, particularly with a band um, and mm-hmm. just just getting to like, um, yeah, to, to feed off other people. Um, my favourite guitarist ever, Joe Walsh from the Eagles, was a two guitar band. And I remember watching an interview with him talking about when him and Don Felder wrote that whole Hotel California solo. I'm sure you all know how it goes. It's a big guitar. <laughs> and he was saying that it, it it really excited him and it felt like a really healthy thing to have a bit of friendly competition. So Don Felder would play something and he'd sort of go, oh, yeah, well, listen to this. And, <laughs> you know, try and one-up each other. And I think that's a really, really healthy thing. And I really resonate with that as well. And um, the, other, the other thing is there's an audience there too and you can feed off them and that's really cool as well. Um, when you go to rip a big solo and, you know, there's people in the crowd that do that, you know, that, that whole thing. Um, and that's, that's really cool because it pumps you up and it goes, well, maybe I can push myself a little bit harder because I'm doing good so far. And, you know, I'll just step out of my comfort zone just a bit and see what happens. And if I fall on my face, no one's really going to notice because they're all too drunk anyway. So, um, <laughs> you know it's a it's a really cool thing um yeah that's yeah, I think I what like, I like about playing music I do really like the idea of band as an opportunity for friendly competitiveness that's a really great way to look at it it is yeah. it absolutely is yeah um but I'm also wondering with now you're back at school because school year started and you and you don't live in a city with a big airport so in terms of organizing your time to get around to gigs and that sort of thing you must be quite well organized well you kind of alluded to it there earlier with airports because like you said there's absolutely none of that no transport um so it's just a lot of me and mum in the car driving around on the Hume highway going to somewhere um and <laughs> that's really how it goes um but I do really have to give a bit of kudos to my mother because she is my manager um, and she's a total pro and she keeps me organized. I'm sort of, I'm getting a bit better at that now, but um, we really do work hard as a team to try and keep everything together. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because it's, yeah, it's a really cool high school job to have, but it's, it is quite an intensive one because you do have to be in a lot of different places and you've got to rehearse in the meantime and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's, it's great that, that, that your mum can help you. Well, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, as, as I always say, it's better than flipper burgers and, um, <laughs> you know, like I, I, I don't have a part-time job. That's the thing that this is my job. And, you know, yeah. some, of, some of my friends at school, it's like, oh, where do you work? Oh, I work at, I work at K-Hub, I work at Kmart or I work at KFC or, you know, um, just little retail things, work at the coffee peddler, whatever, um, you know, but music, that's, that's what it is for me. Cause to be quite honest, I, I don't have time for another job. Um, <laughs> I talk about it once or twice. And then I think, Oh, really? You know, you're away so much already and working so hard. You don't have time. Just don't even bother. Um, yeah. So yeah, this is, this is it for me. This is the thing that I'm doing in my spare time to, for enjoyment, but also to make me money, you know, it's, yeah. It, it's my job. And your, your Instagram bio reads guitar slinger, song singer, joy bringer, which I loved because I think that's often not mentioned enough that music does bring joy. But when did you first realise that joy was part of the job description? Always, always I've known that. And I think even before I knew how to play a single note on the guitar, I knew that because I knew from watching all my idols. I remember being given a DVD of the Eagles live in Melbourne on the Farewell One Tour. I don't know if anybody's seen it. It's from about 2004. 
I was a little kid when it was given to me. I was three or four. It was before I knew how to play guitar. But I just remember sitting there and watching that and being so mesmerized. Um, and it really was a joyous experience. And I knew that there had to be something that was drawing me you know, it was calling me towards music and saying that little voice in the back of your head, of, you know, little me going, you know, I reckon you should do this. This would be a good thing for you. And I think it was joy and enjoyment. That's that's what it was. I think that's what draws me to it. Yeah. As well, well right, I think that's a great point. Point. Yeah. <laughs> But I think joy and bringing joy is a great note to end on because you are a fantastic artist. The songs that you've released have been great. I know how you feel about cars and guitars now, but I think it's a great little AP. Um, <laughs> but I'm looking forward to hearing whatever you come up with next. In the meantime, people can see you opening for Stora uh, towards the end of the month, and I'm sure you'll have other shows that you'll put on your social media. So, Rory Phillips, it's been great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sophie.